Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala syarifil anbiya Iman mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Alhamdulillah In the previous video we have given to you some understanding of the whole idea of classical conditioning So today I'm going to give you another part of the very important aspect of conditioning that is operant conditioning that is developed by Watson, Skinner and all the other behavioral psychologists eh? alright so operant conditioning eh? so this is from our book chapter 4 on holistic human behavior eh? and loss of learning operant conditioning while it's not a very familiar term is a very commonly practiced uh, in everyday life most of the operant conditioning involves what we commonly call reward and punishment. So in operant conditioning, you have reward and punishment and the various aspects of reward and the various aspects of punishment. Operant conditioning is a scientific way of looking at how that which follows a response affects the response in the future. So it is exploring to the future. To explain in a simple manner, if any response is followed by a reward, that response will tend to increase in the future. And if any response is followed by a punishment, that response will tend to decrease in the future. These laws of learning are always logical, but they also can be quite complex. There is very much more to operant conditioning than those very simple descriptions of reward and punishment. There is no aspect of our life not touched by these laws of learning. So none of aspect of our life is not affected by either classical conditioning or operant conditioning. All of us are being affected through the laws of learning. We must know these laws of learning to more perfectly manifest our great potential of free will. There is so much to know about these laws of learning. I almost don't know where to begin. This discussion will need more new terms defined and examples given of these laws of learning in practice. Luckily, since all knowledge is linked and all truth interconnected, all the varied aspects of operant conditioning will fall into place and allow a comprehensive, comprehensive understanding of the whole uh, law of learning beyond the scope of my explanation. Perhaps I could start by explaining how condi operant conditioning is different from classical conditioning. I could tell you how they are the same, but I will save it for later. The difference between classical conditioning and operant conditioning is in the order in which the stimulus and response occur. In classical conditioning, the controlling stimulus occur before the response. We say the stimulus elicit the response. In classical conditioning, we could say that the stimulus controls a response. What happens in operant conditioning is quite different. There is both a stimulus and a response involved in this type of learning also, but they, are, they occur in a different sequence than in classical conditioning. Importantly, the stimulus has a different relationship with the response. It influences rather than control. The response which is involved in operant conditioning is also very different in that it is voluntary rather than involuntary as classical conditioning. In operant conditioning, the influencing stimulus come after the response. The response, which is also voluntary, is followed by a stimulus. Also, the nature of the stimulus which follows the response has an influence on the occurrence of the response in the future. The influence of the stimulus might result in more response, less response, or change response in the future. Operant means to operate upon. It refers to the fact that all responses operate upon the environment. The change in the environment brought about by the response become the stimulus. All responses affect some change in the environment and these changes in the environment will further have effect on the nature of the response in the future. That is why we call this type of learning operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is a description of the relationship between response and changes which follow. So I have, there are many other descriptions, but I will just play the video to give you some more idea, it's much, much more easier to understand. Visual experiment, Watson conditioned a young child, dubbed Little Albert, to fear a white rat. Maybe that doesn't sound so bad, but he accomplished this by pairing the rat with a loud, scary noise over and over, and then demonstrated that the terror could branch out and be generalized to include other furry white objects like bunnies, dogs, or even fur coats. So yeah, that would not fly today, obviously, but Watson's research did make other psychologists wonder whether adults 
adults, too, were just holding tanks of conditioned emotions? And if so, whether new conditioning could be used to undo old conditioning. Like, if you're terrified of roller coasters, but you made yourself ride one ten times a day for two weeks, would your fears fade? The record recent exploration has revealed that the boy known as Little Albert sadly died a few years after these experiments, while Watson eventually left academia and got into advertising, where he put all that associative learning to lucrative use. So that's classical conditioning, but we've also got another kind of associative learning, operant conditioning. If classical conditioning is all about forming associations between stimuli, operant conditioning involves associating our own behavior with consequences. The kid who gets a cookie for saying please, or the aquarium seal that gets a sardine for balancing a ball on its nose, they've both been trained with operant conditioning. The basic premise here is that behaviors increase when followed by reinforcement or reward, but they decrease when followed by punishment. And the most well-known champion of operant conditioning is American behaviorist B.F. Skinner. He designed the famous operant chamber, or Skinner box, a confined space containing a lever or button that an animal could touch to get some kind of reward, typically food, along with a device that keeps track of its responses. Okay, time for a debunking break. Other than maybe Freud, no other figure in psychology seems to be as shrouded in lore and misinformation as B.F. Skinner. So I'm just gonna tell you straight that no, Skinner never put any kids in the box. And no, he didn't raise his children without love or affection, and his daughter didn't hate his guts until the day she committed suicide. Deborah Skinner is alive and well, and she loved her dad plenty. Skinner did, however, invent something called an air crib, a climate-controlled box with a window on the front that was meant to keep babies warm and safe while their moms ran around doing their 1950s lady thing. It's not exactly where I'd like to spend the night, but it wasn't remotely the same as the Skinner box. No one knows where all of these myths came from, but being a somewhat controversial guy, Skinner had a lot of haters, some of whom were probably happy to perpetuate misinformation. But back to the rat in the box. Basically, the box provided an observable stage to demonstrate Skinner's concept of reinforcement, which is anything that increases the behavior that it follows. In other words, you push the lever, you get a snack, and then you want to keep pushing the lever. But most rats aren't going to push a lever for no reason. I mean, there aren't food dispensing levers in the natural environment, so operant conditioning behavior requires shaping. Maybe you give the rat a little nibble of food each time it gets closer to the bar, then only when it touches the bar until little by little in a series of successive approximations to the desired behavior, you reward them only when they do the thing you're trying to shape them to do. In everyday life, we're all continually reinforcing shaping and refining each other's behaviors, both intentionally and accidentally. We do this with both positive and negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement obviously strengthens responses by giving rewards after a desired event, like the rat snack after the lever push, or getting a cookie when you say please. Negative reinforcement is a little trickier. It's what increases a behavior by taking away an aversive or upsetting stimulus, like, say, get in your car, and it does that infernal beeping thing until you fasten your seatbelt. The car is reinforcing your seatbelt wearing by getting rid of that horrible beeping. And it's good, because you should wear your seatbelt. It's important to recognize here that negative reinforcement is not the same as punishment. Punishment decreases a behavior either positively by, say, getting a speeding ticket, or negatively by taking away a driver's license. But negative reinforcement removes the punishing event to increase the behavior. So painkillers negatively reinforce the behavior of swallowing them by ending the headache. So by now, hopefully you're getting the picture. There are things that we want and things that we don't want, and we can be taught by way of those impulses to behave certain ways. But it's worth pointing out that conditioning is way more complex than just the cookie in the beeping car. For one thing, ending annoyance or getting a cookie are types of primary reinforcers. You don't have to learn that. They just make innate biological sense. Beeping is annoying, cookies are delicious. But there are other kinds of reinforcers that we only recognize after we learn to associate them with primary reinforcers. Like a paycheck is a conditioned reinforcer. We want money because we need food and shelter, which are still the primary drivers. Plus, just as there are different kinds of reinforcers, so are there various reinforcement schedules. Like those boxed rats were getting continuous reinforcement when they got a treat every single time they hit the lever, so they picked it up pretty quickly. But if one day the rat chow doesn't come, that connection quickly dwindles and the rat stops hitting the lever. This is a process called extinction, and it is important because that's how real life works. Outside of a Skinner box, you're not going to get continuous reinforcement. All of life is a series of partial or 
intermittent reinforcements that only occur sometimes. Learning under these conditions takes longer, but it holds up better in the long run and is less susceptible to that extinction. So say a cafe gives out a free cup of coffee for every 10 you buy, while another shop pours a free double shot every Tuesday morning, and yet another has a free coffee lottery that customers win at random. These are all different kinds of intermittent reinforcement techniques that get customers coming back for more. Now, Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner's ideas were definitely controversial, as well as the whole scary rat experiments. Plenty of folks disagreed with their insistence that only external influences and not internal thoughts and feelings shaped behavior. It was clear to many of the behaviorists' rivals that our cognitive processes, our thoughts, perceptions, feelings, memories, also influence the way we learn. We're going to talk about how these other things factor into learning next week when we look more at conditioning, cognition, and observational learning. And yeah, also watch kids beat the face off blow up. So we have uh, some ideas of prone conditioning and as we proceed further in chapter 4 of this book, inshallah we'll give you more examples and how it is connected to the way we live and how we can use these laws of learning, both classical and operant conditioning, to have this positive conditioning approach towards human society so that we can overcome the negative conditioning approach that's being used by the mass media, by the food, fast food industry, by the plastic industries, by the sex industries, phonography and so on, which is uh, affecting all of us in this 21st century. So if we can master these basic ideas of operant conditioning, then we can, inshallah, find an antidote to the negative worldview that we are having as human beings in the 21st century to a positive worldview that is what we are trying to uh, bring about the change within the Ummah to post Islamic psychology, always striving to be the custodian, the Caliph of Allah on this earth, always striving to make ourselves good, help others to be good, and make the world good, inshallah.